So the amazing thing is the human brain is set up so it's got a lot of things that it does automatically. So we don't have to try certain things. So for instance, your heart beating, your blood circulating, um, uh, the way you see when you look around, those things are all done automatically. When you jump in your car and you start driving, oftentimes you head on home and you don't even realize that you're driving through the city and what you do when you get home is that you went through the city and you don't even realize sometimes you think back, I wonder if the light was green. And all of a sudden you're, you're kind of replaying it in your head but you did that all automatically. There are times you get up in the morning and you're going to go to a certain spot and if you're daydreaming about something, you find out you're in a different place. I mean, those types of things happen because automaticity runs our lives. So the reason I wanted to mention that is if we let the brain go and automaticity happens, we just live. When I walk, I don't think about how I shift my weight. I don't think about what I'm doing right now. I just do it. Now, there's other times we're much more focused. So what I want to talk about today is what happens when we get focused on certain things. So one of them is how we know something exists. That seems kind of rudimentary, like you would just know something exists. How do you know that X is there? We just look over and you see that it's there. But the funny thing is that we have to have a way of knowing that it's there. And so as you're going through life, what happens is you go through a, a, a philosophical theory called positivism. And it's set up that we know something is there because we can experience it. If you see it, if you smell it, if you hear it, if you taste it, then you know it's there. How many times in your life do you wake up from a really vivid dream and think to yourself, I, I don't even know which is real and which is the dream? Or if you hear a faint noise and say to somebody, did you hear that noise? And you're asking if they heard it because you want to see if their perception is that it's there or is that just you? And so the concept that we're going through is we're testing our environment to see what is real and what is not real. And so we're doing this all the time and it's fascinating. And so what happens now is that um, we each as individuals have a set of experiences and as we go through our set of experiences, it makes up who we are. And as you're looking around, you do different things. It's really pretty amazing. Everyone in this room has a unique set of experiences that nobody else has ever had and nobody else will ever have. You're totally unique because nobody's going to have your exact set of experiences. I just went to an old scrapbook and this is one of my areas out of my scrapbook and that's me and my brother Eddie picking morale mushrooms in Cadillac, Michigan to sell so we could raise some money for spending money. And that's my little bear cub badge there, which they spelled my name wrong, but you know it's not an easy name. And there's the mud pole when I came to Lake State. Back in the day we used to climb a mud pole. We don't do that so much anymore. But those were my experiences, and each one of you have your experiences. So how do we know what's really happening, what's really going on out there? That compilation of my sensory experiences with the perceptions of what is actually happening makes up who I am. And your set of sensory experiences put together with your perceptions makes up who you are. How do you know the stuff in your environment is real? Because you can smell it and taste it and touch it and experience it. That's how you know it's real. Now it's takes care of if we're in isolation. But what about the other people around us? What if it's just real to me but not real to you? If I say I see a bottle of water sitting right here right now, see it? It's right there. It's a bottle of water. I could say that but the first thing probably in your mind is I don't see it. And if you all say I don't see it then a general consensus would be it really doesn't exist for you. It might exist for me but it wouldn't really exist in society. It doesn't exist as we would say it for the collective. And I say that very carefully because it may very well exist for me. There are certain individuals who do see hallucinations, who do have auditory sounds that they hear. They only are the ones who hear them. Tinnitus and you hear sounds. And you can't say those sounds don't exist. They exist to them, but they don't exist to everybody. So how do we differentiate what exists for you and what exists for society? And as we think through this and go through it, it's, it comes back to positivism again. If we can actually look at these things and say, I see it and you see it, now we have senses that go together. But our perceptions are not the same. So if we go to New York City, for instance, I might be terrified in New York City and you might have a great time. We're having the same experience. We're looking around, we're seeing the lights, we're seeing the people, we're seeing the sounds. Everything's going on like that. Why would we have different experiences? Because of my past. My past sensations with the perceptions has brought me up to this spot in my life. 
And if I've never been in a city like that, it's overwhelming and I'm scared. Your past sensations and perceptions have brought you to this point in your life. And you may find this exciting and wonderful. So now we have the same sensations of what's going on here, but different perceptions. So now, what's reality? What's the real perception? And so for that, we have to think through how do we get there? How do we figure out what counts and what doesn't count? And again, we come back to positivism. Positivism has to be a sensory experience, has to be an interpretation. There's your perception. And then there has to be replication. We have to be able to repeat it. Somebody else has to see it. So I see it and you see it. It's seen by more than one person. So if, if many of us see it, then we know it exists. Now again, back to the perception thing. This becomes really interesting. What happens here real quickly, this is an experience because if you say you're really, really excited and I'm saying I'm really nervous, what we could do is we could talk about that. Instead of just experiencing it, if we talk about it, then we find out what your experience is, find out what my experience is, and we look at the difference in the commonalities and we can come to kind of what the truth might be. You see, this might be a really ex exciting place and a really interesting place. It also might be slightly dangerous. If I'm hyper excited about everything, I don't notice the danger. And if you're petrified of every step, you don't notice the excitement. But as we talk, we start to say, wow, it's an exciting place that also has some danger. What we can run into, which is exciting, is that some individuals don't even know when they know or don't know. They might be excited or scared and not realize that it's based on very little. And so two researchers, Dunning and uh, Kruger, did this thing. They were out of Cornell where they looked at people who didn't know something and how confident they were. And what they found, which was fabulous, is unskilled and unaware individuals. Unskilled and unaware. I don't know that I don't know, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. <laughs> Actually, they don't do it that way. I don't know that I don't know, and I am right. Those are the individuals who talk. And this curve shows they have more confidence than an expert does. I don't know what you're saying. I know what I'm talking about. And an expert will never say that. An expert's never, expert never says this is definitively it. An expert will say, you know, the research supports, or this tends to happen, or this tends, and, and most circumstances. No, no, these are the individuals who say, no, this is the way it is. Let's take for an example real quickly. And I'm not going to pick on anybody in here. That would be rude. So I'm just going to ask you for a second, if you're walking on the ice, we are at Lake State after all, if you're out on the ice or you want to go out on the ice, let's go with the clear blue hardest ice you can get. How thick does the ice have to be before it's safe to walk on? Get a number in your head. Don't say anything yet. Now turn to the person next to you and tell the person next to you what number you think that is. How many inches to walk on ice? Go for it. All right, okay, here we go. <laughs> now, let's see what you came up with. So I'm just curious of a couple people. Somebody over here, how many inches would you say? 12 inches, very good. How about over here? Six to eight is really good. How about over here? A thousand. A thousand. <laughs> Boom. A thousand. You don't go out on the ice much, do you? <laughs> oh, this is the one I was after, because you know how big the auger would have to be for that? <laughs> All right, so here's the issue we've got. We've got everything from six inches of a thousand. <laughs> this is good. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineer, 1.75 inches. Whoosh. How many of you had a number right around that? All right. How many had three to four inches? Excellent. Common convention is four inches because that really strong pure ice is rare ice and can have some problems with it. If you go with four inches, you're better off. Six inches, you're better off. A foot, you're better off. Two feet, you're better off. A thousand, it's frozen to the bottom, dude. You're not going to get anything out of the fish and just come back to shore. So here's the deal. If somebody happens to say, I think the safe, it's, you know what, safe, it's a foot. And if the car, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says, actually, it's just under two inches. No, no, it's a foot. 
Well, it does depend on the ice. If the ice is really pure good ice, it's fine. But of course, if it has some melting, some slush in it, you want it to be a little bit more. But if it's pure good ice, 1.75 will hold the average human. And if you're on skis, even less than that. It's a foot. <laughs> And that person's usually the one who has fallen through the ice. Because once you have fallen through the ice, you're done, and it doesn't matter what that ding dong over there says, the egghead, those people who collect all the numbers. I know they don't. And that's dangerous. It's really dangerous because I'm ignoring an expert because of one incident that happened to me. That's a problem. And those individuals, those individuals tend to be really, really confident. And the real problem is really confident people are attractive in that sense because we like attractive people. And that comes from confidence. When you get ready to have surgery, do you want a physician that says, you know, things could go bad, things could go good. We're going to do the best we can. No, we want a surgeon that says, we're good on this. Is that, road a, good, is that a good road to take out of town? Yeah, it could be okay. Mm -mm. That's the best road, take it, it works every time. We love people who are very, very confident. What we don't know, and I want you to know from now on, is that confidence doesn't automatically come with expertise. In fact, sometimes that confidence comes with ignorance. A person doesn't know anything, but they come across as they know it well. So how in the world are we supposed to know? How do we know if the person knows what they're talking about or if they just don't know anything? Well, the way we would know anything, the way we tell if there's a bottle of water up here is we start asking people, do you see it, do you see it, do you see it, do you see it? No, 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 you know what, it's not there, Todd. Let's go check and see what's going on. <laughs> Over here, why don't we start asking people? We'll ask people, what do you think, what do you think, what does the data show? And if I ask people different things, I can find out if the reality is there or not, if it really is happening. And so what's going on now is I have to ask, but, here's a caveat, if I ask the same person, a person who is identical to me, that's what I was going to say, a person who is very much like me, then it's almost like asking me twice. Let's take a hypothetical situation, they don't exist, a person exactly like me, it's like asking me twice. So if you think about that, the best case scenario is to ask a person who is very much not like me. And that is what we want to do. If you talk to people who are very different from yourself, I talk to people very different from myself, I get a reality from them that's different from my reality, and if we agree on something, we've got something. And the point here is, we shouldn't be looking to our friends and people like us to reaffirm our positions. When we do that, all we're doing is sampling out of the same pool. And before you know it, we're so convinced that we're right, we don't even consider other people's perspectives. Diversity isn't something we do to bring people in so that we get different perspectives. Diversity is something we do, we bring people in so that when we listen to them, we can see what reality is. You get reality out of diverse perspectives coming together you get illusionary systems when you put very, very similar people together. That's the danger, and that's why we want to move as much as we can to get diversity in there. But we have to be careful, because the problem runs into is that we like people like us. I mean, who would possibly be better than me? I know me so well. And all right, I talk a lot, and sometimes I'm a little rude, but overall, I'm pretty good. Really smart, or humble, working on that. But the concept here is that you have to be careful because people like yourself, we tend to like those people. We hang around those people, and for good reasons. They're, they're, we're comfortable with them. But getting out of that comfort at times is what we need to do to have the other perspectives. How do we know something really re exists? We have to sense it. We have to interpret it. Then we have to find other people who sense it and interpret it also so we can pull that together. And if we can get that from different perspectives, that will get us toward reality. Our brains are not passive. They're not just going to sit back. We're actively seeking out information all the time. There's all this stuff around us, just like Times Square. What do you pick? What do you think? What do you do? So we're actively seeking information. And as we go through life and actively seek information, we should always be looking at those components. What is it that I'm paying attention to? Is it really there? Can I sense it? Can I perceive it? And what does somebody else come in to do? And if we can pull that together, we can find out how to just figure out what's real, what's real out there. Now, I picked positivism as my topic. I like the overall concept of positivism. I'm a psychologist. I graduated from here with a bachelor's degree in psychology. 
scientific methodology was what it was all about. You run experiments, you collect data, you summarize the data, you, this is what scientific methodology, it came from positivism. There are some things we have to consider though. Positivism, from the philosopher's point of view who came up with this, have considered positivism kind of dead since about 1935. A lot of people don't know it, but it's dying out or dead. And the reason I bring this up is because we have to be careful about this idea that we grab information, we perceive it, and we compare it, which is still good, viable tenets, but there are more and more ways of actually looking at the world. And so what we really want to do is look and say, what are the other ways of looking at the world as well? We don't have time today, but this is a great foundation and a great place to go, but we can't stop with, there's one way to do this. When we look at things, though, I can look at the Eiffel Tower and say, I know the Eiffel Tower is there because there's a whole lot of people standing there looking up like this, and it's really ridiculous if there's no tower there. <laughs> Got to be something there they're all looking at, and it's gorgeous. And you can show a picture and people say, oh yeah, that's the Eiffel Tower, I've been there. So people have come together and they see this, and that's wonderful. The concept here is how do we find perspectives to determine what is real out there because it's actually not that easy to tell sometimes. And as we do that, we get to a point where we start looking at things differently. We start making sure to have diverse perspectives. We make sure that I'm actually sensing something and perceiving and figuring out what's really there. We talk to people about tough topics. And by pulling these things together, we find out what's real. What is real? And if I can't agree with you, if five or six of us get together and we can't agree on something as being real, then we've got an issue. But as diverse as we are, there's some fundamental components we can find to agree on. And if we can agree on those things, we can move forward. We define ourselves by what we see, and what we see depends on what we have seen. So you are a combination, in my mind, of the sensations and perceptions that brought you to this point in your life. And moving forward, you can go with automaticity and just let the brain kind of drive you through where we do the same types of things every day and talk to the same types of people and look around in the same ways. Or we can look at things more deeply, we can look at things more carefully, and we can look at it with other people who are not like us and look for those combinations that could move us more toward what is true. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you.